I think we originally started this morning talking about you know, running microservices at scale. Uh, this is not that. Uh, although I always feel that if you're running, you know, scale means one more microservice than you know how to work with. And that kind of means it's scale for me. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about this. And obviously, please you know, ask questions through the app. Um, I tend to be uh, a, a early pioneer in a lot of technology. So a lot of the stuff I play with and talk about uh, it's probably not ready for prime time with a lot of clients. Uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, but chances are I have a pretty good track record here. The next four or five or six years, a lot of things I talk about become, become more practical. Um, so I started out my career, I did a lot of work in that, but you know, when Agile came along, I got excited by Agile. And one of the things about Agile was uh, the uncertainty of requirements used to drive us nuts back in the waterfall days. And I did a lot of code back in those days. And I kind of had this sort of model in my head that says, you know, around, you know, around Y2K, when we started talking about Agile, there's this concept of certainty all the way to uncertainty. And it was kind of like, you know, waterfall worked really well if you knew exactly what you wanted to build. And all the processes were around that stuff. And if your requirements are steady, it works really well. But what I was finding was I could actually, Agile will allow me to handle a little uncertainty. That if you didn't quite know exactly what you wanted to, you still wanted to change your mind some, Agile provided significant competitive advantage. And I went to client after client developing systems around Agile because they didn't exactly know what they wanted to handle. But if they really did have no idea what they wanted to build, it was kind of like a giant graveyard. And it was kind of these are the sort of projects I would walk away from because you have no idea what you want or how you're going to pay for it or anything else like that. So it's like, I don't really want to engage in you. So a certain level of uncertainty I could handle, but not so much. And this is where I stood, you know, at the, again, at the turn of the millennium. Uh, the world has changed a little bit about that. First of all, you have the more processing power. We're more clever at some level. Uh, but we are also now handling different type of problems, problems I would call fuzzy problems. And sort of fuzzy problems sort of come in this sort of flavor. Uh, this is the Kinefin model from uh, Dave Snowden. He describes various problems. He says there are problems that are simple with the cause and effect relationships, very straightforward. This is the world of best practices. Uh, there's complicated problems where you need an expert. There is a cause and effect relationship. But there's also more than one way to do it. So it's kind of the world of good practice. There's no kind of best practice when it gets complicated. That's like saying, oh, Java is the best language for doing everything in there, and everything else is inferior. Um, no language sort of you know, holds that title. And then, but he stopped there. He didn't stop there. He basically said there are also complex problems, where the cause and effect relationship is not discernible. That is, just because this happens, I can probably figure out why that happened, but I can't predict the future based on that. It's not useful for that. And that was kind of very, very, very telling for me because it sort of said you can't really push these problems into complicated. It's not because I'm not smart enough. It's nobody is smart enough to solve this. And these are your financial domains. These are financial markets. This is Google advertising. This is all your recommendation engines. Should I loan you money? It's all these sorts of problems fall into that complex domain. And these are problems that turn out to be very interesting to solve right now. Uh, Dave Snowden would also say you got disorder, which basically means you don't know until you watch the problem, which type you have. And you got to be very careful because you tend to be prejudiced about the ones you want to work on. So if you sort of again look at this problem space, you tend to organize yourself differently to solve these types of problems. So again, if you're working on a... So, da, 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 sorry, let's get... One of my work picture. There we go. If you're working on a simple problem, this is the org structure that makes sense. You have a bunch of people that are doing the work, and a manager who tells you how to do it best. He has a very precise role. And a manager, a manager tells the managers how to train people as well. So this is the right organization structure if you're solving a simple problem. You know, it may look sort of draconian, but it is the correct structure. Then when you get to the complicated problems, you need experts. Somebody that really understands this. And they, they tend to be rare birds. And to some degree, you need an expert, uh, and they're very expensive. And because they're expensive, then you have another team that does what they tell you to do. And so you put a manager in place, and you put employees in place to do that. So in, certainly in, in software development, we tend to call those guys you know, customers or call them architects, whatever. They feed stories to the team, and the team puts the stories they get told to do. 
Again, this structure works really well for solving these complicated problems. Because there's somebody that understands how to solve it. He puts his knowledge through stories or other mechanisms back into the team, and we solve the problem. But when you get over to complex problems, there is no concept of expert. Because the cause effect relationship does not exist. People may think they're experts, but they're lying. They're not real experts. And customers may say, I know exactly what I want, but they don't. You have to humor them sometimes, say, yes, I'm sure you do. They don't. Not for this sort of problem. So again, sort of the role of that expert it doesn't exist. As nor, nor does this kind of what sort of manager do in this environment. And so you wind up creating a whole different structure to solve these complex problems. One where you basically say, here's some problems. I talk about it at the high level. Here's one a success criteria. Make money, long page retention times, whatever it may be. And you turn them loose and say, start doing it. And when something they do works, you say thank you, and you try it again the next day, it works, fine. Third day it fails, fine. Stop doing it, try something else. This is the nature of complex problems. So this becomes, so you basically begin to get to sort of the managerless processes, these new aggressive agile processes are solving those complex problems. So you go back to these requirements uncertainty, this sort of graveyard that I thought existed, you know, in, year two, in Y2K, that now basically becomes the fuzzy problems. And they are actually solvable. You can actually do things with the systems to make these things solvable. Partly because they have a lot of processing power, we got better languages, um, and various other tricks like that. So now I think this is actually is solvable, but it has to solve it a different way. All right, that sort of brings me up to sort of talking about what's sort of coming now. Obviously, as, as uh, Adrian was talking about, we're moving into this sort of what I call the age of agents, where there's people, things out there running on our behalf. And they're very fuzzy things. And they're suggesting how we can do things better. And whereas they get a lot of press associated with sort of uh, trying to help you do things, and you see a lot of things about the voice interface to them, this is kind of like the marketing part of it. The true power is kind of under the covers, where there's various services interacting with other services, trying to make guesses about what you want to do. And the voice interface is just kind of the icing on the cake. It's not the really important part. A little very sexy stuff, but not the important part. And so we have this working in, in hand. But again, solving these fuzzy problems. Um, I'm going to switch over to see if I can get a video running. So I, I look at my house and say, well, you know, I, I don't exactly sure what I want to do in my house in terms of automation because it's fuzzy. Uh, and by the way, even if I figure out exactly what I wanted to do, it's probably not what you want in your house. So I think I want to play with this a little bit and see how it feels. And I want to play with the microservices in particular. So this is uh, my flat in Vegas. Um, and you notice I can hit a magic button and all of a sudden all my lights change colors. Um, not, a, not a terribly interesting trick, but it's kind of interesting because it's way easier, by the way, to paint your walls with paint, with, with a colors light instead of paint. Painting takes a lot of processing power. But if I wanted to have a red wall, I can have a red wall. If my favorite sports team, which is the Bron Broncos, which are orange and blue are playing, my room goes orange and blue. And it's not a big deal to make that happen. So that sort of stuff's available to you. Now the question is, is that really interesting to do? And again, I have colleagues that sort of say, okay, that's, that's kind of interesting, Fred, but why would you ever do something like that? Back to play. Why would you ever bother to sort of do that stuff in, in your house? Oh, wow, it actually plays nicely. So I, I got a lot of toys uh, to play with. Um, and one of the reasons I come to conferences and talk about this is because I can now take a tax deduction for all my toys. Thank you. So I have a Hue light system. I got about 10 meters of light strips in various places in the house. I got about nine light bulbs. Uh, I got this little nice little Hue uh, Phillips switch. Uh, this little round switch here actually has no battery, has no wires. Um, it's actually powered by the pressure of your finger, will create enough energy to send a signal. And so it kind of never runs out of batteries. Very interesting device. Uh, I do have the Amazon Echo, uh, got an Apple TV, uh, sort of the typical devices you have to sort of interface into the world. And I want to play with these things to sort of see how they work out. I also have some you know, Wemo switches. I have the, uh, the magic AWS button that says I hit the button and something magic happens in the AWS cloud. I don't exactly sure what's happening, but Something interesting is happening in the cloud, but all I can do is press the button. 
Um, I, I actually figure out, I want to figure out how I hooked that to my own network. So, it's, you know, this is all very nice. A lot of toys out there. A lot of people are getting involved with that. But why? Why are they getting involved with this stuff? Um, to some degree, it's... Uh, to some degree, it's kind of high volume potential. If you can solve this problem with IoT devices, you have a lot of devices out there. You can scatter your costs across this stuff. It gets very, very cheap to do it everywhere. So that's why I think a lot of companies are getting excited by it. Uh, I think also the home is a really tough place for usability because we're not all programmers sitting back there writing microservices back in our houses. There are other people out in the world that don't do that. Can you make it that easy for them to use? They don't require a lot of training associated with that. And there is kind of the fun aspect, especially if you are a programmer. So I have a colleague in, in Silicon Valley who basically said, you know, Fred, I, I can't understand why anybody would want to do this. And I found it a bit disingenuous when he said that, because I actually you know, brought up my iPhone, and I did a little sniff about how many devices do you have hooked to your system? He's got 74 things hooked to his wireless network. And he's got this triple high rack in the basement running it. I'm like, dude, you know... You think this is not important, but you've got a triple high rack. Now, I haven't got room for that in Vegas. I don't have a space for a triple high wide rack there. Um, so I want to see if I can do it a little bit less, less than that. Now, a lot of guys out there are sort of contending for sort of, I'm going to be the control center of, of your devices. You certainly have, uh, you know, the Amazon Echo, the, you know, a, very, a very popular product, a very surprise hit, I think, at some level. Um, and it works really well for that. Uh, of course, then, of course, Google has to clone that. So there's a Google version of this. Uh, also quite successful, uh, moving quite a bit of volume of those as well. Uh, Microsoft just once said, you want you to just do every Xbox to do this. Now, it turns out, you know, programming to your Xbox to do this is actually a little more difficult. Uh, they kind of have dropped off the radar a bit. But not has Apple. I mean, Apple's sitting there with their Apple TV saying, this is our device. Uh, of course, they just announced their home port, so their version of sort of the standalone speaker to sort of do the same sort of job. But they are contending for to be the guy who's running your house for you. And of course, the Apple devices fit very well with the iPhones and the, and the HomeKit sort of stuff. Interesting enough, actually, uh, Philips was contending for this for a while. They had a nice hub. Uh, it ran lots of devices. Um, and it was a good contender for doing this. They, could, they had an open API. And then they had a release where they decided... I really want you to buy Philips devices, not these other guys. And so they locked down the API in a new version. And of course, we the programmers were like screaming bloody murder about this. We kind of completely walked away from the device completely. Uh, so we just kind of basically, and they figured this out really quickly themselves, good news for Philips. So a few months later, they opened it back up again and other people can attach. But frankly, it was too late. We'd already got enamored by these other platforms that are much more open and continue to be open. So they kind of lost out. I think one of the most interesting guys that came along was Samsung, about how did Samsung think they should do this? And their answer was, get your refrigerator. So this was a consumer electronics show last year. They have a new version of it this year. But basically they're saying, look, you have a refrigerator in your house. Yeah, I do. Well, you've got lots of power there, so that's not a problem. And oh, by the way, there's a great place to put a big screen on there that you can touch. And I'm like, that's actually really clever. Now, the cl not clever part is it costs $3,000. But uh, it's a really interesting way to think about it, because it's always there, and it's kind of handy, and it's got a screen, and everybody else has to have a little help to make that work. So I think it was a very clever entry. But all these guys are continuing to be the guy that's running your house. Of course, each one has their own protocols, and, and you're sort of getting into this Tower of Babel in your house. So of course, you have uh, all these different APIs, and, and it, even articles are starting to come out about how much API clutter there is just in IoT, just running your house. Not worry about industry, just in your house by itself. And of course, that means, of course, there's going to be some middleware. So now there's a whole family of middleware coming out. So instead of having maybe six different APIs to use to it, we now have 12 different APIs we could possibly use. Because middleware just creates more. It doesn't ever solve the problem. Um, so again, I don't necessarily want to play in this world. I kind of want to sort of handle it myself. I don't want these other guys to try to run my life for me. So I said, okay, well, let me try to use microservices myself in the house. I've played with microservices for many years. Uh, it seems to be like something would be fun to play with a bit. So it is uncertainty because I don't know what I want to do. So it has that fuzzy nature that's really good for microservices to try to solve. 
Because if I write really primitive microservices, I can rearrange them in various and sundry ways to try to solve my problems. Um, I'm also trying to, I want this replaceability because this is a fast changing environment. I want to be, I know all the time these APIs are going to be changing. And I want to isolate those changes as much as possible. And I basically want to layer on top of these primitives the things I want to do with it that I think would be much more, much more, uh, less volatile, so to speak. So I'm a big fan of asynchronous microservices to handle these sorts of situations because I like the decoupling you get with asynchronous microservices. Uh, the idea is basically you're only going to be talking to an event bus. And unlike these synchronous services where you have to basically sort of say, I know who you are and you register with me and how you do some of these things, uh, I, I like, the, I like the, the asynchronous. It's not as common as synchronous in many cases. But it's kind of consistent with this whole movement to reactive and agent-based programming and all these other things, these movements that we're moving toward. Asynchronous is very much in tune with those. So I'm feeling pretty good about that choice. Uh, also, these services tend to be very small, very, very loosely coupled. And again, that allows me to deploy very, very fast. And it is about how fast I can get deployment done. I don't need this restful registration process because everybody's talking only to the event bus. And that's all the one I'm talking to. And it does allow me to do the experimentation. Uh, this is kind of my, my metaphor for when I build uh, asynchronous systems like this, especially the ones of this size, that are relatively small, is basically the idea there, there'll be an event bus called, I call the rapids, which is basically every event running is going to be published on the same bus. My log messages are going to be there, my messages from services, my traffic user journeys, uh, all of, everything's going to be on the same bus. This allows me to write an application very easily because all the information is there. Most of that information I ignore, but I'm able to sort of write a new application without having to go to five or different sources to get it. So again, using the philosophy that says you do something interesting, you publish it. Uh, there's sort of a second tier that says I want to sort of carve out a set of these messages which the services care about. So a particular service will care about a certain set of messages. I will pull those out with a microservice and put them into a river. And finally, there is a concept of you do need, at some point, the current state of every entity. I need to know what your latest email address is. And so there is a need for have reporting and reporting databases. And frankly, SQL makes pretty good reporting engines. So there's a concept of pawns, which are static information. It's not the dynamic nature of the information has been lost. Uh, but it's kind of very important to have entities this way. So that's kind of the model by which I sort of think about when I design these systems. Uh, this gives rise to some new patterns of usage. So this happens to be called the need pattern. And the idea is you're sitting there with a high-speed bus, and the service expresses some need to the bus. It could be something like, hey, dude, should I loan you money? And I don't know if anybody's even listening. In fact, you have to handle the case where nobody's going to listen to the question. That's the nature of asynchronous algorithms. In this case, i got a couple of guys who are listening to that. Maybe the blue guy is looking at your bank account sees the fact you make regular deposits, you never go negative, kind of feels like you're pretty good, pretty good bet for the loan. The green guy could be running off to the service bureau. You could write another guy that says, gee, I, I think if you are university graduated and you went to a good university, you're probably more reliable. I could check that, make a vote based on that, and keep adding them in. The idea is these things are completely independent of each other. Uh, the, the yellow guy doesn't know the blue and green even exist. He hopes they exist, but he can't count on it. He doesn't know how many of those guys exist. And basically, all they're doing is voting about, yeah, I think you should loan the money or not loan the money. And you're sitting back here deciding whether you want to take advantage of that or not. So again, new architectural patterns associated with asynchronous algorithms. The nice thing about this is it's easy to add version 2 of blue service. Just put it on the bus. I don't have to turn version 1 off. It can stay there and compete for the business. But if I think I've got a better blue service, I can put it out there. So A-B testing is kind of built in, which is important for my domain. And if the green guy goes down, I'm still getting votes. Things are still happening. Now, somewhat degraded at some point, but I'm still working. And that's important also for robustness. This also allows me now to build what I call incremental applications, where I can start with just a few things that work and make it better very aggressively. Um, I teach a workshop where we basically do car rental examples. We're trying to fill in advertising on the car rentals. And so we write ourselves some, uh, a little, some, some services down here that off, put offers on there to put more advertising on your page. And then I, that works really well. I can get that working in a, in a week very easily. 
And then I say, well, I can make a better answer if I know if you're a member of my frequent renter program. Or maybe I've done some segmentation analysis about what type of things you do tend to like. I can add that information there and give you a better answer. But I'm constantly running through this whole process. I'm constantly running experiments very aggressively. And again, incremental applications become a very powerful part of this. this by the way, continuous deployment, absolute there. Continuous integration, not interesting. Continuous deployment is what we're after. I don't need to integrate all the time. I need to get the code out there and try it out. All right, so for my home, I made some technology choices. Um, they weren't the most aggressive technologies. I decided I'd use RabbitMQ for my event bus. Um, I don't really need the storage nature of a Kafka bus. I don't need that persistent nature of it. Uh, RabbitMQ has some better bindings in some cases, so I'm going to run RabbitMQ in the, my, my home system. I'm going to use JSON for all the reasons that Adrian talked about versus XML. Um, there are some better you know, JSON formats right now, some very compact stuff. I don't need that yet. I just assume be able to read so it's on the, on the wire, so I'm going to stick with JSON for now. Uh, I'll use Docker. And I'll use Swarm because Swarm's kind of lightweight Kubernetes, and I don't need anything more heavy than that at this point. And at some point, I will actually grab some, some dedicated Linux boxes and stick them in some closets, uh, a couple of them for redundancy, uh, and just put, run my Docker instances on those guys. And that comes, that's sort of my technology for running my house. I do believe that we, are, we sort of make design decisions on the fly. I like, I like dynamic design decisions. I, like, I actually make a lot of architecture decisions on the fly. But to some degree, the architectural principles, uh, you kind of have to decide those up front. And so I do spend time thinking about what my principles behind the architecture I'm trying to implement so I can actually uh, make good choices on technologies and other things. Um, I'm definitely going to take advantage of, I have no idea what I want to do, I'm going to design on the fly. Um, but since I started this big trip, I've been traveling basically continuously since about mid-February mid at this point. So I haven't had a chance to go home and play with this, but I have a whole bunch of new ideas from various conferences and talking to various customers and their situations. So I'm in the process of rewriting everything. Um, which is kind of, kind of nice with the just-in-time design. Uh, I do build behavior-oriented services, which means my services can be very small, but they have to do something. They're just not just pumping raw data out. Uh, I don't believe in entity-based services. I don't believe there's something called a customer service that understands everything about a customer, and he's the only thing that understands about customers. I'm going to scatter that information to everybody who needs it. So sort of behavior-oriented services is a design philosophy. Uh, if I do something interesting, we're going to publish it, even though I don't have a use for it yet. This is an idea we stole from Google. This is how Google did a lot of their early, early thinking, and it paid big dividends for them. And I'm going to get reliability through two tricks. First of all, my message is going to be idempotent, which means if I get the message twice, that's okay. I don't care. If you tell me to turn the light blue and it's already blue, I'm going to say, hey, I'm fine and happy with that. That's not a bug. And when you have that, you can actually just bring multiple instances of your buses up, multiple instances of your services up, because it's idempotent. So we have two guys deciding you turn the light blue, and they say turn the light blue, and I'm perfectly happy with that. And I'll run one of those instances on each one of the Linux boxes, so if something goes wrong, I still get blue lights. Uh, frameworks, there are not a lot of frameworks out there for asynchronous microservices. Um, so I'm going to steal a little bit of code I use in my workshop. Uh, the workshop code is actually, it's open source. It's up on, the, on the, uh, my GitHub account. Um, as long as you don't use it for training, you feel free to use it. I'm also developing some Ruby gems that are a little more sophisticated that I'll be using in my class and in this situation. But I'm using some frameworks from that. Um, just to give you an idea what some of the code looks like, this is the Java version. I'm not doing it in Java, by the way. Uh, but this is the, sort of the Java version. You can sort of see that you start out by saying, yes, I'm going to listen for, at a river because that's the paradigm. I'm listening at rivers. Uh, I'm going to establish a connection to the rapids, because that's why I always publish back to the rapids. So I establish that. I make myself a new river, and the river is going to have some filtering criteria associated with it, so I only want messages that meet that criteria. And at that point, now I'm ready to start my service up. So I bring a new instance of my service up, attach it to that river, and now I start getting messages. And when I get a message, basically, it comes into this packet API, which passes the packet, of course, that says it's a packet. Here's a, here's a river to publish to if you want to publish something back. And here's a whole bunch of things that I didn't like about it. These are warnings in this case. If something's really wrong, I get an error call, and I get more information about what's wrong with it. Good for debugging, but most of the time, you just comment that out. And that's all it takes. 
And by the way, I think as, as we heard about uh, moving to functions and lambdas and like like this, this is two lambdas. One lambda for defining what I'm interested in, and another lambda here defining what you want to do with it when you do find one. So I think this ports very well into this next generation of technology as well. So that's my framework. I don't know anything heavier than that. Give me a rabbit in the queue. Give me these little frameworks. I start writing services. They won't be much bigger than this. All right, so how do you start building the system? Uh, it turns out most of this IoT hardware usually has about two interfaces. It has sort of a primitive level interface where you really control things like lights very carefully. And most of these are trying to be better than that. They want to provide you more functionality. So they have a higher level functionality API. Uh, most cases they call it scenes, which seems to be the terminology for that. I'm setting up a scene associated with how my, my, my house looks. Uh, I'm going to put myself my, cop, my uh, Rabbit Q bus in place. So I'll put an event bus on top of that. And now I start writing some services. And I call these the, the tier one services, the ones that are interfacing to the raw hardware. I need some way to take that raw hardware and turn it into something interesting on the event bus. And so I'm going to write services that do that. And it'll probably be a different service for reading from that hardware versus writing, because there's two separate jobs. And I can separate those two things out independently. So I'll write some services that interface to the hardware and put, put sort of the summary of what's going on with that hardware onto the event bus. Then I'll have sort of tier two services, which will have sort of higher level concepts, like scenes. And I think scene is not a bad way to think about a lot of these things in your house. So again, most of the time he's just pulling off the bus, but occasionally he may have to actually try to interface back with the API. I want to try to avoid that. Because if you don't try to avoid that, you're going to get sucked into their version of what higher level stuff looks like. And I don't want to get sucked into that. Because Apple has a view, and, and I'm sure Google Home has a view, and, and uh, Amazon Echo has their own view, and they keep changing all the time. I don't want to play in that game with them. But there'll be a couple of times where I think I may need to do that. Uh, what happens to be the case with these Hue things? When I hit the little button here on the, uh, on the Hue system, it sends a signal to the Hue Hub, and the Hue Hub picks a scene. As far as I can tell so far, I can't get, I can't get a trigger based upon just hitting that button and a primitive trigger. It's going to be a scene gets changed. So I may have to suck the idea a scene got changed and then kind of ignore the fact it's a scene and just take it as a button. And so I'll set it up that way. So I may have to do a few things just to suck things out like that. Tier 3 services are ones that are actually trying to do higher level things, sort of across devices. Like what happens if this particular time of day, I walk in, if I'm walking in the middle of the night toward the bathroom, maybe you want to turn on a light really dim so I don't trip over something. Or I walk in the house and it's after dark and probably turn on some more lights. So sort of putting together lots of different things to sort of build sort of a choreographed system. So I'll have those. Uh, there's also a really need for a lot of sort of monitoring. Because one of the things about event buses is there's lots of things are going on and you want to know what really happened. The nice thing about an event bus is if you sort of record everything that happened, it's easy to debug. Because here's a, here's a time sequence of everything that went on. Here's the message I sent to you. You sent this garbage back? Seriously? It's like I know exactly where the bug is. Uh, debugging complex systems today, in monoliths in particular, you've got to put all the logs together. Then you see what, what happened relative to the logs. You put this time sequence together. Now I can start debugging. With event buses, you start debugging at that point already. In my experience, about 90% of my effort was getting that time sequence right. Then I can figure out what the bug is. Uh, I carved off 90% of the time just by having event buses. Uh, I also have things that are looking for problems. Uh, it could be that yeah, somebody tells, tells me to turn the light red, the other guy says turn it blue, and we go back and forth. I want to be able to detect those situations. I probably won't write any of these until I actually do have a problem. I can think of lots of things that go wrong, but until it goes wrong, I'm probably going to spend the effort doing it. And finally, if I figure out if it happens a lot, I want to actually correct it. And again, that's something I'm not going to do initially. I'll just make sure I can find it. But if I find it a lot and I figure out how to correct it and can do that reliably, I will fix that. So only one of the earliest corrections is if one of these services goes down and stops heart beating, I'm going to bring it back up. I may actually bring it back up on the other Linux box in particular. But again, that's the sort of thing I'm going to do error correction on. So lots of different types of services, each of which will be very, very simple, easy to write. So one of the problems I have to have with this is maintaining state. Let's see actually if the video actually works. Oh, I love it. So here's the house. It turns out if you turn off the switch on the hue light bulbs, which used to be blue, and turn it back on, everything goes back to white. In other words, the bulb has forgotten what state it's in. 
Uh, so I really wanted to sort of be insistent. If I tell you what the light blue, I wanted it to be blue. So uh, let's see how I might do that with my new system, because clearly the hue box doesn't do this for me. So I'm going to show you what the choreography of this is. And choreography is kind of the right way to talk about this. There is no orchestration engine here. There's no sort of God service that says, I understand how you want to run the house. Because every time I change my mind, I have to go into the God service and all the other services that it talks to. Every little service is doing its little part, but there is choreography going on. There's no guy sitting there saying, this is everything you have to do. Different philosophy in general. So I got a choreography for sticky colors. So a little flow about how this actually works. I got my event bus. I got my Hue hardware. And I'm going to write myself a, a, basically a little microservice that just pulls the state of the Hue hardware and tells it what it is. In other words, what lights are on and what colors are they? And that's his entire job. And so it turns out you have to poll for this. You don't get told automatically. So every few seconds I'll poll, figure out what the colors of the lights are. And I'll publish a whole bunch of messages to the bus that says, hey, here's, here's the lights, here are the colors. But I'll also say, oh, by the way, the Hue system doesn't know about this light. It, it was registered with the Hue system, but it's not there anymore. Basically, when you turn the switch off, it loses the light. So at least I'm going to say all oh, that also. By the way, here's the light. I have no idea what it is. It's, it seems to be off, but it's, right now it's an unknown state. That's information. I'm going to publish it to the bus. I don't care how, who needs it yet. Just publish it to the bus. So I get this stream of messages coming on the bus saying, here's the lights that are on and their colors. And oh, by the way, here's some lights. I have no idea what the state is. I have another service that actually sets the colors. And it's, again, sticky sort of thinking. So it basically says, if you tell me to, 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 the light should be blue, and he says, oh, wait. Then it says the light is red. And I say, no, no, the light should be blue, so I'll turn it blue. If he says the light should be blue, and I say, oh, but it's already blue, I'm perfectly happy with that. So I won't send anything. So now I have enough, actually, to make it sticky. So when the guy turns the light switch off, all of a sudden these lights are going to be declared as unknown. When the guy turns it back on, it's going to say, oh, by the way, this light is white. This little service is going to say, white? No, no, blue, blue. And I'm here with a blue message. So I get sticky colors with that. That's kind of all it takes. Uh, of course, now we can sort of add more behavior. I want to set a scene up so that lights have maybe my, my favorite uh, football team colors on the right time and day. So I set up a scene concept. It's a higher level concept. It's sort of a tier three service or a tier two service. So uh, if, if somebody actually hits that little hue button, by the way, I want to take that. I basically have figured out, so far I have to I think I have to poll to get that hue button, polling scenes. I think I found a way I can actually get it to be more uh, not polled, but we'll see if I work when I get home. Uh, meanwhile, all it says, that button got pressed. I have no idea what this means, but this button number one got pressed. Now, it turns out button number one is what light scene cares about. He says, that's, oh, that means I should wake up and do something. And he'll say, oh, by the way, these are the colors, the colors the light should be. He just publishes that to the bus. He hopes somebody's listening, but he doesn't care. I mean, some of these lights he's telling to be colors may be off. Not his problem. His job is over when he says, oh, by the way, these are the colors you should turn your lights on. Of course, this guy's going to get all his messages. If he actually can control the lights, he'll actually change the ones necessary. And now I have scenes. Again, not a lot of code associated with doing these little things. Uh, very easy to sort of keep playing games with this stuff. Uh, it turns out also it's kind of interesting to sort of know what they are, if I, especially if I'm traveling here. It'd be nice to know, that, you know what the lights look like. Um, so, so I kind of built sort of a, basically a dashboard service. And this is kind of like a monitoring service at some level. And all he's doing is sitting there receiving messages about what color the lights are. And then he turns that into a JSON packet that summarizes that, pushes it back to the bus. That's the end of his job. Now, I can I write myself a web page that sort of picks up that JSON and renders it in some sort of map of my house if I want to play that sort of game. I can push that to, to a, my iOS device and render it some other way, all based upon that JSON status. But also, I have a little status message that's sitting on my bus. It's getting logged all the time. It says, oh, by the way, this is what the colors of the lights are. All very powerful stuff. So again, very easy to sort of build these things with very tiny services, and you build up some very sophisticated behaviors with just a few small services running some very simple code, choreography. So my observation at this point, there are a lot of messages flowing around. That's the nature of asynchronous stuff. 
I have a, a bus that can take a lot of messages. The RabbitMQ can take a huge amount of messages, especially at, at this sort of scale. And I don't care. I'm not trying to save messages. Uh, I'm trying to make it easy for me to program. Uh, I think one of the things that we, uh, that uh, I think it was actually was Netflix. I'm, I'm quoting Adrian. I think he's gone. That's good. Um, well, we talked about how you organize your systems. And the question is, do you organize your systems? If you're a guy like Netflix, do you organize them to, to optimize your Amazon footprint because that's very expensive? Or are you trying to optimize for customer experience? And the answer comes back, no, no, no. We're trying to optimize for programmer productivity. We want to be able to change things quickly and try ideas out aggressively. So I will waste a lot of messages. I'll write lots of services. I'll throw lots of extra Docker instances around. I don't care. I'm after my productivity. Uh, you see there's no RESTful interfaces, so there's no registration process. It makes it much, much easier. I haven't got that God service that understands what services are running right now. don't need that. Uh, I really have no constraint upon having multiple instances of every service running in parallel. I will definitely bring up two guys watching the Hue box, running on different Linux boxes. I'll bring up two guys, they'll set them. Because it's, it's easy to do, it's allowable, and it's item potent. I don't need any unit tests because the code is so small. How do you need a unit test? Let's just deploy and see what happens. Uh, and that's one of the things you can do when you write very small things. And basically, the system's designed to catch failures. So between the monitoring and very specialized error detections, uh, that's how I can aggressively deploy into a system. I don't need acceptance tests. I don't need, I don't need my acceptance test framework. I don't need my deploy, test system to deploy into or my integration system to deploy into. I just deploy into a live system. And the live system, if it has a bug, it's going to figure it out really quickly. When the lights start flashing strangely, I know something's strong. So let's go back and talk about process, working in this sort of environment. Again, there's sort of no rules here. And so you wind up having sort of a different sort of a process. Now, in terms of XP values and extreme programming, all these things are true. Whether you're working on a fuzzy problem or working on a, a traditional problem, these are things that are still important to you. When I look at sort of the traditional Agile practices and the roles associated with Agile, you sort of make a list like this. Uh, I'm sure it's not a complete list anymore, but these are sort of the major things you associate with Agile practices. And these are sort of the guys that are, are playing the roles and stuff like that when you're doing Agile systems. But when I'm playing in these fuzzy domains, basically, you kind of wipe out a lot of these things. It's unnecessary because we're experimenting and we don't have experts. And the idea of having sort of even a, a business analyst who's going to tell us what we need to do is nonsense because he doesn't know. Basically, what we want it for is a customer who says, ah, here's what success means to me. Here's what it, it possibly means to me. And I, in this case, I'm the customer. I want cool light stuff. Uh, and I, I just need a developer. That's it. So it turns out when you're solving the fuzzy pro problems, the roles and responsibilities and the practices are radically different. Same values. We still value all those things, but I'm in a different world. Again, think back to the Kinefin model. Uh, just an example of this in action. Um, well, I guess not. I wonder where all those X's went. Well, I ignore that chart. So basically, fuzzy and viable. If you sort of look at what Agile is, it's about stories and specialists and TDD and, and just solving those sort of problems, traditional problems using Agile practices instead of waterfall, this is still the right way to do it. I still tell my clients to do it this way for solving those practical problems. But when you get into fuzzy stuff, I'm about ideas. We're focusing on how fast I can try an idea out. I don't need a requirement. That, that says it's too important. I just need the ideas. Full stack developers, guys who understand every part of the system because they're doing things very quickly. I don't want to have handoff between my design team and my architect and my QA guy. I'm not, I don't want these handoffs. I want to just do it, move forward with it. Uh, the system actually is designed to fail fast. It's an inherently fail fast system. We write a lot of code to make sure it does fail fast versus I make sure, make sure it never fails. Again, if you think about Netflix and how they design their system, it's a fail fast system. Uh, microservices work really well for these fuzzy problems because I can write something and it's whole. Here I'm talking to the Hue box. I can change my mind about scenes and everything else. I'm still talking to the Hue box the same way. That code doesn't have to change. When the Hue box changes their API, it's the only place I have to touch. The isolation is very powerful there. And the event-based architectures allow me not to have to worry about registration and A-B testing is easy and lots of other things are there. So different type of problem on the scale, different attack to this problem is necessary. Oh, good. Um, 
In the future, I'm going to get some more boxes. There's a nice hue uh, motion detector. This will let me turn the lights on when I walk to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Um, I've not got a thermostat put in, which is interesting because I live in Las Vegas, and it gets really hot. And when I get home, I don't want it to be, you know, 35 degrees inside the house. Um, so I need to put that one in there really quickly. And I need to get, obviously, these, uh, these Linux boxes because I'm, right now I'm running this on my, uh, my Windows gaming machine, which runs Docker really well. Uh, but not a lot of Docker instances. Uh, future is you, things you got to also worry about, some problems I'm looking forward to trying to solve is you need something that's very easy for you to define how a house works. Something that, you know, uh, the people in it, that own houses that are not programmers can figure out how to use. And I think the roadmap for that is actually pretty clear at this point. This is the IFTTT guys. Uh, only I don't want necessarily to tell everything about my house to some external vendor somewhere in the cloud. I want to keep this down to me. Can I generate microservices based upon these specifications? Uh, apparently, somebody told me that in one of the conferences that somebody's already done this with Node.js, so it looks very doable. And uh, so I'm looking forward to tackling that problem as well. Um, the other thing that's going on is obviously, you know, Docker can run on Raspberry Pis. And Raspberry Pi is actually a really powerful machine after all. Um, so I'm looking forward to sort of playing with that as well. Um, so you can get started with this. You build yourself a little uh, you know, cluster of, of Raspberry Pis. And I'm kind of looking forward to bringing my, my friend from uh, California back out to me and say, look at my cluster <laughs> versus your rack. And it says, oh, I'm doing everything you're doing here uh, with my little Raspberry Pis. Um, hopefully, you'll be a little jealous of what I can do in my little flat. Well, that's kind of the story of microservices and IoT. Um, Lessons I would say walk away with is microservices work really well for, for little, small experimentation things. Uh, it's a nice way to get your feet wet. Asynchronous works particularly well for that. Uh, but beware, no matter where you're using microservices, particularly asynchronous, rethink your process. Uh, if you're solving fuzzy problems and you're using it with microservices, you need to change the process by which you're using. Thank you. <laughs>